Hello everyone, Rick Albert here, real estate broker in the Los Angeles area. And I have the pleasure of speaking with a good friend of mine, Michael Izbotsky, CFP from Planning to Living. We're gonna talk about fun stuff with finances and what's been happening, especially now with COVID. So thanks for being here, I really appreciate it. Oh yeah, thanks Rick, I'm, I'm really excited to get started. Um, I'm happy to, to chat with you, I appreciate the, the intro and um, yeah, let's, let's get into it. Cool. And I know that we've talked in the past. So if someone wants to watch that episode, they're, they're happy to go on YouTube, Instagram, anything like that. So let's start with how generally speaking, every, everything here is general people. So everyone's financial situation is different. Talk to, to Michael or another financial oh, yeah. professional. Let's just throw that, throw that out there. Uh, but how have people's spending habits changed since the beginning of COVID? from like what you've been seeing with your, even if it's yourself or with your clients, anything like that? I've seen a lot of stuff. I've seen a lot of interesting things, some not so good things, but in general, I've found that a lot of people are uh, spending less, but also utilizing those savings for the better. Meaning, so rather than uh, spending $100 a month to the gym membership. They're going on maybe bike rides or picking up surfing. Like it was one, ha one thing I picked up on. I hadn't surfed in years. And I picked I'll, up a bike. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you, Rick, it's not like riding a bike. <laughs> <surfing>. <laughs> I used to, I was winded the first time I paddled. I, I paddled out and I was like, okay, I got to go back in. I'm, I'm done. So, <laughs> you know, that's been helping my cardio. So people have been saving there. They're not eating out as much. I know at least here in LA, there's a lot more outdoor dining. But my experience is people aren't going out to eat as often because it's not as pleasant of an experience. It's still fun, but I feel like, you know, people aren't traveling as much. So they've been going camping, which might be 30 bucks a night, 40 bucks a night max at a campsite rather than, you know, spending a couple hundred bucks at an Airbnb each night or at a hotel. So with that, the extra savings, you know, some of my clients have an extra few hundred dollars to put into the stock market or to pay down some of their credit card debt or even their student loans, which is a huge topic now because student loans, you know, 0% interest, right? So those payments are going straight to the principal too. So I feel like that's, that's been key. Well, yeah. And, you know, realtor.com came out with a report a while back saying 63% of Americans are actually saving money right now. Right, even with, um, and I did the talk with the insurance broker recently, where you know everyone, all the insurance companies were, at first we became gimmicky, but then they were actually forced to lower their insurance costs <laughs> on the cars, right? Oh yeah. Which, which really, like, I would say off the record, but this is being recorded, like they're the one of the biggest winners in all of this, right? They're still collecting, but with people not driving as much, there's less um, claims. So oh, yeah, yeah, they're they're, they're, they're happy. Oh yeah. I think I actually put out a, a hack towards the beginning of this pandemic. Yeah. Saying, you called it. Yeah. You, you are not, you're driving maybe to and from the grocery store. Everyone's working from home, especially in LA. No one's really commuting. Lower your, the miles driven. And then <laughs> turns out that, you know, a lot of these insurance companies are giving back credits for, because they're not driving as much because they were over the less amount of people driving, the less amount of accidents. So the sure. premium should be lower. Yeah. To your and point. Exactly. And even then, like we started doing Instacart. Oh yeah. Right. Cause Instacart, I think it was like a hundred bucks for the year and we just order everything we want and it's delivered in two hours. So we can so even easy. save a trip. Yeah. And it's like the, and we, you know, what's great is also you get to shop around between the different, and this is not a plug for Instacart, by the way, there's other apps <laughs> out there, <laughs> but it was just nice. Like between me and my wife, like we can check out different grocery stores. Hey, which one has the best deals? on stuff and just have that shipped in, right? So then you just save even more. Um, I know it's funny because my car is a lease and I was already on track to being grossly over on miles. And once COVID hit, I'm actually now way below. Oh yeah. Like it's a win um, in for, that respect. Yeah. <laughs> for, for someone like me, I'm, I'm actually behind. Like I'm, I don't have as much reason to drive. So I'm like trying to drive more to hit those miles essentially. Cause I do lease my car as well. So I'm like, oh, to well, get the most out of it. Yeah. I'm like 12,000 under miles. I'm like, well, it's not going to happen this year. <laughs> <laughs> now out of curiosity from being a uh, financial advisor and planner, why did you choose the lease? I know I, my reasons, but I was curious to hear yours. 
Yes, I'm a big fan of leasing. Well, it depends on your situation, right? That's like the standard uh, answer. But for me personally, from a cash flow perspective, it's a lot cheaper to lease a car, right? So I'm not taking on a five or six year note to pay for a car with interest rates. So for my car, I might be paying $300 a month because it's a three year lease. But someone who bought that car might be paying five or $600 a month, depending on how much that car actually costs to buy. So for me, from a cash flow perspective, I have more, it's, it's easier. You know, I'm in, a, I'm mm-hmm. in a newer car. I don't have to worry about maintenance. A lot of these times you lease, you know, for the first two or three years that maintenance is covered and you get a new car every three years or so. Whereas, you know, some now, if you wanted to buy a car, you'd want to buy a used a hundred percent because everybody knows as soon as you drive it off the lot, it depreciates. Mm-hmm. but also you're going to be paying a lot of money for a car that you might sell in five or six years. So you might just be breaking even at that point. If you're breaking even, you could have had, you could have saved more money throughout the years, like in cash flow. So each month you would have had more money to deploy elsewhere. Yeah. And I think for me, and as I do more driving, I start to lean towards buying because of the miles that I do, but um, you know, the, one of the original thoughts was I'm hedging my bets on the value of the car, right? right. So my, my last one, my last lease, I went grossly over on the miles and it had a lot of miles on the car. And so when I dropped it back off, you know, I even said, Hey, I'm willing to buy it, but I want it at a discount than what oh, yeah. you know, was on the note. And they're like, Nope, we're not giving you a discount. I'm like, all right, not my problem. Now they have a car that's going to be difficult to sell. They're going to have to sell at a steep discount. And I go run off. Even me overpaying on the miles, I'm still ahead. Right. It's kind of the thought process. I mean, even too, so uh, it's also more of an incentive for business owners or like entrepreneurs, you know, people like you and you and me, uh, mm-hmm. because you do get the, you know, tax write-offs benefits. Right. Um, more... From a cash flow perspective, like I said, I, I would lease, you know, you could lease for a few years and say, hey, you know what, actually, now I know which car I like, I'm going to be in this car for five, six years, like me personally, the car I would buy would be, you know, like a Jeep Wrangler or something, one that might hold its value. I, I, so I you can go camping. It. Yeah, I can go. I and love camping. Go to go surfing. Camping. <laughs> yeah. It, oh, yeah, it'd be perfect. So I could, I would drive that thing to the ground for 10 years, right? It's to me, it's sort of like a classic. Mm-hmm. But I mean, if I'm just going to get like a Honda, I'm not... I don't know. It depends. I'm not going to buy a, a new BMW. That's for right. sure. I'd rather lease, lease something like that. Yeah. No, I, I, I tend to agree. Yeah. So, you know, it, it would even be an interesting strategy because you, for those that have never leased before, there's a predetermined value at the end of the lease should you want to buy it out. So if you don't do a lot of driving, it could be interesting to lease in the beginning because then, because the value at the end is usually based off assuming you maxed out the miles every year. Correct. So you might actually get a deal if you decide to buy that car out outright because you got it for less than what they're assuming the value would have been. Right. Could be interesting. So oh, yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned the cash flow savings and millennials, and I'm just as guilty. You know, we have to really start thinking about retirement, right? Like we, I think that we tend to live day by day, especially because you know we've lived now through two recessions. So we're oh, you yeah. know, right. Um, how do you, how should someone start off in determining how to put their money towards retirement? Like what are the steps? Well, first and foremost, be, well, in every situation is yeah. different. Oh yeah. Well, <laughs> right. that, yeah. I don't even have to say that again. Yeah, there you go. Time, but it's done. It's, I always say this all the time. You have to make sure you take care of your current self first. So that's not going out to buy, you know, buying Gucci and Prada, or whatever, but that's, you know, having six months of, savings of you know hard fixed expenses like things you have to spend for like you know groceries not eating out but groceries rent utilities things like that then once you have all that covered you figure out okay cool i have an extra pool of money or i have you know let's say i have an extra six hundred dollars coming in each month how much do i put towards retirement of course the more the better right sure you want to it for us being, you know, millennials, let's say, you know, most of us are in our thirties now, let's say you want to, you're not going to be retiring for years, at least 
it, it's hard it's hard to basically put all of your money towards something you might not even see or be able to access for years, right? It's all about instant gratification. So it's how do sure. you find a balance? So rather than me saying, Hey, you know what? You have $600 extra a month to go put $600 each month into, you know, your retirement savings or whatever that may be. Maybe we can do 400 into retirement savings. And then the other 200 you could put in, you can invest towards a home purchase or a travel fund, things like that. So it, it's really dependent on how, how much money you're, tr I guess, how quickly you're trying to grow that p retirement pool and how soon you want it and how much you want to end up with, right? Because if someone who's investing $500 a month will get there a lot more slowly than someone who's investing $1,000 a month. Sure. So that is a case by case basis. But for us young millennials, and I'm assuming that's the the audience we're talking to primarily, I'm still a huge believer in the stock market, right? I mean, the stock market's a couple hundred years old and not once has the stock market ever recovered. Like not once has it not recovered, excuse me. So right. every time it's recovered from its previous crash or low or whatever that may be. I mean, even right now, the, the COVID crash, Corona crash, whatever you want to call it. I mean, the stock market, was back up in a few months back to, yeah. and it passed its previous highs. So it's crazy times out there. Um, but I'm, I'm a big believer of investing for the long term. So I'm not being wigged out by these yeah, crashes. It's, it's the same in, in real estate, right? So if someone says, well, I'm afraid that prices are going to drop and it's like, so what? It's a paper loss. You still got to live there. Exactly. The, the only time you really mark a loss is if you sell it. Right. So what I tell my, and I'm sure it's the same for you. It's what I tell my clients, look, if the stock market drops and when it drops, I'm not going to be calling you to sell out because you lock <laughs> in that loss. I'm going to be calling you to buy in more because long-term it's going to go back up. Same as right. the real estate market, especially here in LA and California as general in general. So that's my big, my big thing is when the market tanks <laughs> buy more, <laughs> right? Actually, Don't yeah. run away, run towards it. Correct. It's, it's the same. It's the Warren Buffett approach, right? Like when there's blood in the streets, that's when you find the best deals. Sure. Oh, for sure. So, so we, we've actually touched on a little bit. So in terms of real estate, you know, especially for millennials, a lot of them, you know, they have their student loan debt under control. They're making decent money, hopefully, um, or at least they're enough in their career to where they can start thinking about buying a house. And for many, it's just a natural progression, right? Part of the American dream. It's just the next just the next step of living, regardless of how the market's doing. So right. what are some things from a financial perspective that they need, take, need to take into account with their finances, when it comes to home buying, you know, all that? Okay, there's a couple of points. I'm assuming we're gonna go back and forth on this a little bit. I'm sure. Uh, Cause you're a real estate guy, this is your forte. I personally, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, the first thing I'll say, I have two points. The first one I'll say is from an investment standpoint is I, strongly encourage my clients not to view their first home as a, as an investment. Okay. Yes, it can be a type of investment, but you want to focus on it being first a home and then maybe second an investment. So meaning an investment from the standpoint of, you know, things like you do house hacking or, you know, having that ADU, the accessible dwelling unit, getting a little bit of extra side income from there, helping, you know, paying down, paying towards your mortgage or having roommates. The reason why I say that is because let's say you buy it, buy a home for, you know, half a million dollars and appreciates to $750,000 and the mortgage is all paid off this, that, whatever. Let's just say you have $250,000 gain. Mm -hmm. How do you access that money? It's very, it like the $250,000 gain is stuck in the house. So how do you utilize that? I guess. Uh, well, That's but you could, so yes, how would you access it? Line of credit, cash out, refinance, sell it. But could you make the right. same argument for stocks? Yes and no. So if you sell the house, let's say you sell the house to reap that $250,000 gain. Well, okay. now you need to buy another house. Right. You need to go rent. So what are you going to do with that? Um, or so from the investment perspective, I'd like to tell my clients who are a little bit more ambitious and sure. who are on big growth traje trajectories is sure. You can maybe buy a smaller home today, like a condo or something or a duplex or wh whatever that may be. 
And rather than selling that to access the cash, purchase a second home. And then now that first home you buy is, is the investment. And then, that second, and then that second home you have, it's, it may be an investment, but you might live in there till the day you die. So it might not be an investment specifically for you, but your heirs might benefit from that. So that's one way. So you I define feel. the investment as money coming back into my pocket. Yeah, exactly. So like with the stock market, it's easy to, it's, it's liquid, right? Like I can literally go in, you know, 11 a.m. here on, on the West Coast and buy and sell like in an instant, right? I'll, I mm -hmm. can get my money out for, for most cases. It sure. depends on the exact type of investment you're using, but in general. So with, there are ways to actually access, basically it's called securities back line of credit. So like you can have a huge investment por portfolio of let's say just, you know, $100,000. You could use that as collateral um, for a loan as well, similar as you would like a HELOC With a house. or yeah. as a, exactly. So there are ways around it too. And it's going to be a lot more liquid than a physical home that takes time to sell. There's a lot of transaction costs to sell a home, things like that. So sure. that's my big, my number one piece of advice is yeah, uh -huh. you can consider it as an investment, but consider it as a home first okay. and an investment second. But you know, it's, it's easy that you bring that up. <laughs> what do I think? Um, well, a couple of things. Um, one, and when you sell a stock, when you sell stocks, you get hit, you get taxed on that, correct? In general, yes. Generally, yes. yes. Okay. So with selling a house, you don't for the first 250,000, if you're single, first 500,000, if you're married. So that money's tax free in your pocket. Um, but you bring up a really interesting point. So I helped a client recently. He bought it. He was thinking investment first, house second. And we found a phenomenal deal for him. And I'm not saying that just to tote. It's like, it, it was a good deal. Uh, it was a house right. already with the second unit. His family there can live go. in the front unit. And he's actually living for cheaper than what he was in his one bedroom apartment. And here he has a whole house. So it was a win. However, he wasn't a big fan of the location because he was thinking investment first, home second. And because he's the one living there with his family, all of a sudden he started having doubts after we closed escrow. He's like, did I make a good choice? I'm like, yeah. do the numbers work? He's like, yes. I'm like, you wanted an investment property, you got it. So I think you pose a really interesting concept. It's like, well, yes, it, either way you're paying down a mortgage. So you're gaining equity in the property. To your point, you can't touch it unless you sell, do whatever, but at least you're gaining something. But more importantly, you're enjoying the space. And Absolutely. With, especially right now during COVID, more and more, like um, I just did a seller webinar recently and part of it was I touched on the COVID lifestyle and what that <laughs> means, right? It's like, what does that mean? It means, okay, don't worry so much about staging your house. Worry about how can I fit in an office? What can I do to the landscaping? Smart. Because I need to be able to, like if you have weeds everywhere, get rid of them because oh, yeah. I need to show that my future children can play soccer back there. <laughs> or in my case, just hurt themselves because I am not athletic whatsoever. <laughs> but like, you have to start thinking those things. Like, it's it's less about um, the numbers and more about the emotion that's tied to a home. Correct. Yeah. Right. I I I think that's a fair point too. I mean, I I was speaking with a client too. He's currently renting, and then his first instinct was, "Oh, I want to buy a cheap property and use it." Because initially, he wanted to buy. And then he's thinking, oh, it's a little too expensive. You know, I, I can wait three or four years, fine, no big deal. Sure. But then he, we, we spoke recently and said, oh, maybe I want to buy a cheaper property so I can buy it now, but then just rent it out. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, thinking to myself, okay, well, what's the break even, right? You might barely be breaking even if, or you might be taking a loss depending on how, how it's all the deal is structured. Sure. And you might be foregoing purchasing that home you actually want, basically pushing out another three or four years extra, depending. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of to your exact point. I say the first home you buy, buy it where you want to live. Like so you sure buy a fixer upper, right? You'll, the home will appreciate, which will help if you want to sell that and use those funds to purchase an upgrade or just keep it and then rent it out in the future. But first and foremost, yeah, yeah that, you want that's that what I did. Livable. Yeah. Yeah. When I bought my first place, I said, okay, I want to be close to the office and I want walkability. 
nowhere did I really talk. I mean, I knew that it was going to become a rental eventually, but to your point, like my first things about the place was more about me. Absolutely. And then I fit it around what I could afford and, you know, made sure the numbers work. And at the time I decided to buy a fixer because all the quote unquote done condos were done horribly in my opinion. So I was like, <laughs> like we go into places like done condo and it's like 10 different types of flooring. It's like, this isn't done. This was just thrown together. <laughs> I don't want to have to pay a premium to have it, to rip it out. So I ended up finding a fixer. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's especially I think right now people are starting to think, how can I turn my house into a home? Oh, for sure. So yeah, that, that's the number one. And then kind of on yes. that point of purchasing, buying a home where you want to be, mm-hmm. it's, I, I think we've talked about this in the past is rather than saying, oh, I want a million dollar home. I mean, I'm saying I'm throwing a million out there because we're in LA, but okay, Correct. instead of that million dollar home, think about, okay, how much can I afford each month or how much do I want to spend each month in, in my monthly payment? And remember it's not just the mortgage payment itself it's the mortgage it's the insurance it's the property tax it's the maintenance it's the you know the utilities all that stuff so all in what can you afford so let's say it comes out to being let's just say five thousand dollars a month okay Mm -hmm. so how much loan can we get to equal five thousand dollars or excuse me how much loan can we get, including the taxes, et cetera, sure. can we get to equal that $5,000 payment? And then work your way. It's okay, fine. Now we have the budget, let's say, whatever, $750,000. Okay, cool. Now you know where to look for a $750 home. Yeah. 750000 excuse me. 750 sure. would be pretty nice. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, it's 750000 yeah. So in our situation, we're living in our accessory dwelling unit, renting out the main house, and the what we designed our, we'll call it ADU because it's short, we designed it to where it's all electric. So we didn't have to worry about splitting gas. We already had two separate meters, but we didn't split the water. And mm-hmm. so th- effectively the tenants have to send us the water bill and then we split it. But what's been great about that is we get to see their, effectively get to see their bill. So now we have an idea. Okay, if we were to live into a house, this is how much the utilities are going to cost. Perfect. Right? Yeah. And because living in a condo, it's fairly inexpensive. I think my gas bill was like eight bucks a month. Oh, that's cheap. Yeah. And my electricity bill, on average, no joke, I think the lowest was like 25 bucks a month, <laughs> as high as during the summer months, maybe like 75, okay. right? Because you're just blasting the AC. Especially in the valley. Yeah. Oh, God. I know. I'm like <laughs> sweating here. Um, so, you know, it's a good transition to kind of learn to your point, because utilities are expensive. Um, you know, who's going to mow the lawn, right? Most people hire gardeners, especially here in LA, not because oh, yeah. they just don't want to do it, which may be for some, but for a lot of people, it's, like, it's just not a good use of their time. Correct. So I think, so to your point, you kind of have to budget everything. So when you do budget everything from car insurance, health insurance, you know, things that lenders, lenders look at your car payments, but they don't necessarily look at your car insurance. But like how, how do you prioritize budgeting for someone, right? Cause not everyone's the best budgeter. So how, how do you decide what order? Right. So a lot of people, there's different, like a lot of CFPs and other financial planners, things like that. They'll they'll take like a, an approach of, Oh, you shouldn't spend more than like, I'm just throwing a number out there. I forget exactly what it is. Cause I don't really use this that often is oh, sure. 30% on living expenses. Got but it. For me, it's, it's more of what I'm, I take more of a goals based, based approach with my mm-hmm. clients. So, okay. What is most important to you and when, right? So, okay. Maybe you want to retire, let's say you're 30 and you want to retire or be able to half retire by the time you're 55. Okay how much money do we need to invest each month or each year to make that, make that happen? Mm. And then I work back from there and say, okay, cool. We've designated to your retirement. Okay. You want to spend 10,000 in travel each year, foreign, domestic, whatever. I mean, obviously now it's different during COVID, but let's say sure. 10,000 there. So, okay, we'll build a small portfolio there and then everything what's left over of like, so, then we can say, okay, cool. This is how much we can allocate to your home. If that's not enough for you. Okay. So maybe instead of retiring or semi-retiring when you're 55, let's push that to maybe 60. 
or maybe instead of having, you know, a couple million in your retirement pool might be a little bit less. And, you know, I'm not a huge fan of that. I'd rather have more as a safety net. So I'd rather push that retirement out a few years rather than lower the amount that we're aiming for. But that's, it, it's all, it's all personal. Um, sure. If you're already stuck in a lease, like let's say you're spending $2,000 a month in rent. Well, I mean, that's pretty easy to work around. So at, based after all of your fixed hard expenses, you know, what in and taxes, whatever else, what income do you have left over? Then you can kind of start putting the pieces like figuring out where each dollar goes. Sure. Um, but if you're looking to upgrade or move into a new home, so instead of going like going from 2000 to 4,000, <laughs> Okay. So what People are you do it? Be, yeah. Well, so exactly. Like what are you going to be giving up? Right. Is it going to be giving up towards your future goals of like of your investment goals, or maybe you'll be traveling a little bit less so you can get a nicer home now. You know, I, yeah. I know a lot of um, young couples or like new families, right. Where they have kids are like, yeah, I can forego traveling a few years. We have a baby. It's not very, efficient or easy to take them on long international flights we're not going to be traveling as much we might just go on more camping trips or more beach trips whatever that is so yeah and that makes sense right it's almost like what are the big ticket items that you can't control those have to be paid first of course you should always pay yourself first that's kind of the general rule of thumb right yep i mean we have that set up where it's like it's an auto pay to our savings every month it's like, just, oh, yeah. so it's just done. We don't think about it. So how often should someone like review their monthly budget? Is it one of those where they should just review it monthly? Should they review at the halfway point? Like what, I, what do you? Yeah. To your point, it was, it's perfect transit. Well, not transition, but perfect timing. Basically. So I have some clients still do, let's say $200 a month into savings mm -hmm. automatically. Like you said, I'm just $200, just arbitrary, arbitrary. Mm -hmm. Then maybe every quarter. So every three months when we, cause we'll, some of my clients I meet with on a monthly basis, some of them every couple months, depending what they have going on. So let's say at least on a quarterly basis, we'll say, okay, how much money do you have left over? How, what's your cash flow? How does it feel? So some people might be putting away $200 a month. And then they say, Hey, Michael, I actually have an extra, you know, thousand dollars at the end of each month. Like what should I do with it? Okay, great. Let's act. Now we know, we can maybe increase the savings or increase mm -hmm. your investments or, Hey, maybe we can actually put this towards your house down payment fund. So, um, that's, it, it's hard, it's hard to say, you know, how much you should be saving. If, if you're already at that six month mark of savings, right. then you have a lot more flexibility. Sure. If you're not at that mark, then it's a dependent on, okay, let's say maybe you only have three months. Okay. So how soon can we get you to the, an additional three months of that full six months? You know, what's that going to take and what do we have to give up? So maybe it's half to your retirement, half to the savings. So you can still keep that process of contributing to retirement, but it might take you a few extra months to fill up that saving the emergency fund or cash reserve. And that makes sense. Yeah. And I know we talked about this before. It's just, it's interesting that especially for millennials where, you know, we hit the first recession in 2008, we weren't as affected by it. Mostly our parents, right? Cause we were graduating high school or entering college, but we still saw what was happening. And so we're like, so intuitively we should be like, all right, we need to save, but you know, we were young and dumb. Why not? And then we hit COVID and it's almost like, oh crap, I should have saved, but we've already gone through this. It's oh, almost yeah. like we forgot what had happened before and how we don't prepare for it. Right. So I, I agree with you. A lot of people, I, I feel like now people, COVID will be in the back of our mind, like this whole crash and yeah. you know, layoffs or furloughs, whatever that is. It's going to be fresh in our minds for a couple of years. And then a lot of us will forget about it and then we'll be sure. a little bit more lax on our savings. So in a sense, it was good. Like a, Hey, I told you, so let's, let's get this right. going. Like you, now you, you actually understand firsthand what, what this is like, but I actually found it's interesting too, is a lot of uh, younger millennials, right? So like, let's say like early thirties, mm -hmm. they, a lot of them have more cash on hand than I initially expected. So it's a matter of, mm -hmm. Hey, let's actually put these dollars to use 
rather than sitting in a bank account that's yielding like practically zero percent. Right. Right. You're losing to inflation at that point, which was surprising for me to find. Interesting. Um, okay. That all makes sense. So switching gears a little bit, generally speaking, I know this is gonna be super general. What is happening in the financial world in terms of, even if it's just from like perspective of like our financial planners now being used now more than ever, is it the stock market's now being overutilized? Like, well, what's, what's kind of happening behind the scenes? Let's call it that. What's happening behind, behind the, the scenes? scenes? Yeah. What's going on in your world that people don't know, think about? Like there's stuff happening on the real estate side that nobody in the, the who, unless you're actually in it, don't know it. So what's going on behind the scenes in your world? Absolutely. I'll keep it as simple as I can. And it also does tie in a little bit to real estate, which is great. So maybe you can comment on that a little bit. Okay. Essentially. So what people probably notice the most, and it's what I've heard from a lot of my clients and friends is, Hey, Michael, this high yield savings account oh, is now paying horrible. me maybe 0.8%. It's gone down. Of the 2%. Yeah. It's going lower and lower and lower and they're annoyed about it. I'm like, I'm raising my hand. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Right. So that sucks, right? Because your savings aren't, you're not earning as much. However, historically speaking, when the, basically when inflation rates are low and you're earning less on, you know, debt instruments. So like the, the savings accounts and bonds, things like that, historically speaking, equities, so stocks, the overall stock market does better. It's better for the stock market. If the interest rates go down. Yeah, essentially. Yeah, uh-huh. because more, more people flood to the stock market um, because you're going to get higher yields just from appreciation. Some of the companies might be paying a little bit higher dividends than you can earn at the bank uh, or bonds. It, that, that varies, ascent, but essentially people flock to the stock market because they're looking for a higher yield, higher appreciation when the interest rates are so low. The other benefit to having lower interest rates. Yeah, it sucks that you're not earning as much in the savings account. However, many millennials who have mortgages or car loans, now they're able to refinance or even purchase, I guess, at lower Mm -hmm. rates. And I know you and I talked Mm -hmm. about this. So now you can get the same, you can get a more expensive home maybe for the same, for the same payment, or you can have that same, price point, but lower payments. So a lot of my clients have been looking to refinance because it'll greatly impact in a good way, their cash flow. So one of my clients might be saving between 700 to $800 a month on a simple Mm -hmm. refinance. And he's going to deploy that. He's going to start putting a little bit extra into his kids, 529 college savings plan. Like it's, it's a no brainer. Yeah. So that's the, the main benefit there. So I don't know if you want to speak a little bit. Well, first of all, I agree. I remember I set up my high interest savings account. Um, it was before the wedding because our thought was like, okay, we, we had, we paid the wedding in cash. That, that was a big thing for me. I didn't personally want to put debt on the wedding, you know, putting debt on something that happens in the past just didn't make sense to me. So we put that money in the high interest savings account. It was literally like 2.5%. Yep. I'm like, I feel like an investor, <laughs> like, like, I was just like, like, this is awesome. And then it was, it started going down a little bit. I was like annoyed, whatever. And then it like dropped, it started dropping. This was actually after the wedding. So I was like, okay, at least the wedding has been paid. Right. I think now it's at down to like 0.6%. I'm right. like, but then they still make the argument that your local savings account is a quarter of a percent. So like, it's yeah. still, you know, over double what it would be otherwise. It's like, it's just not as exciting, but you know, the, the refinancing has been key. I know we're in the process of doing that now and we could be saving, you know, anywhere from like 600 bucks, maybe even more a month. I have clients, I have a client of mine, you know, we became good friends. He refinanced, did a cash out refinance. So he replaced his loan with a new loan and took out $50,000 and his payments went down by $8 a month. Eight dollars. Yes, we. Um, I got a quote from one lender where we could refinance into a twenty year, so shaving off, uh, let's call it nine years off our mortgage, and our payments only go up by thirty bucks, forty bucks, if we really wanted to. Now, for us, we want to convert this to a rental, so it's more important that we get the payments down to get the cash flow than it would yep. be to pay it off sooner. 
but it was just fascinating to see what's been happening. You know, and the refinance uh, market is just crazy. There's taking 60 days to get it done. It's crazy. Because purchases are the priority. I have a client, he's locked, he just locked in last night, 2.5%. I don't know. Wow. Like, I, I wouldn't let anyone borrow money for two and a half percent. Like, even if you ask me for money, I'm like, dude, F off. I'm, you want like 20%. <laughs> like, I'm not giving you for two and a half percent. Like it's, it's, it's almost crazy, which is why the, at least on the real estate side, it's super nuts right now. It's for once in a long, probably a long time, it's a good time to both buy and sell because it's a good time to sell because yeah. the market's hot. And if you're a buyer, it's a good time to buy because the rates are so much lower. Oh yeah. Um, you know, keeping current matters, which they do a bunch of real estate analysis. They actually showed assuming an appreciation, I think of over 5% from last year, because the rates went down, it's actually cheaper on a month to month basis to buy this year than it was last year. Oh yeah. The That's because the rates are so low, right? Yeah. Right. And so it's kind of interesting that I, I guess I never put two and two together that the mortgage rates would be tied to my high interest savings account. So now I don't feel as mad. Yeah. <laughs> like now I'm not as pissed. There you go. Yeah. So I appreciate that. <laughs> sure. Yeah. I'm sure you'll see too. I mean, obviously credit cards are going to just naturally be higher than everything else out there. Well, mostly everything else out there. So in terms of interest rates. Yeah. In terms of interest okay. rates. Yeah. So like you're still going to be paying a lot in credit card interest rate, but if you check your statement, you're, you'll be surprised. You're like, wow, I'm not, I'm not subject to paying 25, 30% like I was in the past. I think yeah. it's like, it's definitely, you know, in the low teens for some of these credit cards, which is crazy. So, so question for you, and I don't know if you know the answer. I've been seeing a lot of promotions where the creditors are offering 0% interest. If you transfer the balance over, even like on existing cards, is that, yeah. why do you, is there, I don't know if you know this, but like, is there a reason why they're doing that? Why so many, I mean, I've had, on, we have a couple cards because we were paying for the you know remodel and stuff, and like two of them were offering zero percent transfer rebalance, no problem. I I mean I know that they've been well. I guess it's one they just want to get get the liabilities on like they want to basically get it on their books. Sure. Right. So and, and there's a transfer that, fee of like yeah, three to five percent, which exactly. could be a couple hundred bucks. They make that, then they hope that maybe you don't pay it off in time or you continue using their services after the transfer. I don't know if I I'm not sure if it's more than normal. Uh, right. but that's just, are, yeah, that's true. It's just an something I've observed personally. Yeah. I don't know if it's more than normal. I am a big fan of utilizing those in certain circumstances as sure. long as you are very diligent and disciplined because right. some people can get carried away and then they end up having five or six credit cards and they're in a worse, worse off spot than they were to begin with. Yeah. I wonder if some of these credit card companies are doing it one to get the, the money in, but also to recycle that money to give out loans. I, I'm not sure. I don't know either, but that, that might be, we'll find out. Certainly will. Yeah. I'll, I'll make it a homework, homework to do list for me. Okay, that cool. And that's just more just out of curiosity to see why they're, they're doing it. Um, so what are, so you've talked about credit cards. It's smart if you do it right, right? You kind of leverage zero percent interest. What are some successes and some failures that people are doing with their own personal finances right now? Like what are some mistakes they're making or what, or, you know, what are they doing right and wrong? Okay, let me think. So the successes I feel like is easier for me to speak on. Sure. Some big, big successes now are, you know, my clients or just people in general have been hammering away at the student loans because mm -hmm. it's, they're taking advantage of the fact that they're at 0% right now. So the payments are going straight to the principal. And by so, zero, they're also being yeah. deferred. That's what you mean by the company's good to zero percent. Correct. So they Correct. don't have to make a payment, but they might as well because it all go towards principal. Exactly. Exactly. So you know, some some of my clients, like especially grad grad. Um, oh yeah. Yeah, graduate loans basically are a lot more expensive than your undergrad. So you know, some of my clients have seven, eight, almost nine percent interest. So I say, hey, make your payments same as you would if maybe even more towards that. I mean, the stock market averages, you know, let's say seven to 9% a year, depending on which period you're looking at. 
whatever, let's say it's 8%. I mean, that's, that's an in, instant return on your investment right there is that 8%. You're just chipping away directly to the principal. So that's a big win, especially Smart. for those clients with higher interest rates on their student loans. That's a big win. The other one is, I think we spoke on it earlier. Basically they have their cash flow is a little bit more, what's the word? I not luscious. That's a, that's a weird word, but basically hmm. they have more money yeah. that they can deploy. So they're able to invest that more, whether that's in their retirement accounts or towards a down payment fund. And a lot of them have been utilized, had utilized that stock market downturn. So they said, hey, they, they had enough cash on the sidelines. Boom, they put in, you know, p- very mechanically. I think I've talked about this on mm-hmm. another pod- podcast in the past. They didn't, they didn't care what the stock market did that day. They knew it was cheaper. They said, it's been two weeks. Boom, let me put some money in another two weeks. Boom, let me put some more money in. So those are the top two, I think. So they came out ahead with this market, you know, rebounding. I don't know if it's going to go back down again. Nobody knows. All I can say is long term, it'll go up. Right. I don't know how, how long it'll take. Same as real estate. I don't know. It might be another sure. year or two before things. Who knows? So those are the top two. They're just paying down debt in general and then mm-hmm. refinancing. People have been doing re- really well with that. The pitfalls people fall into, and it's not so much when I'm kind of proud to say this, not so much my clients, but I do notice like just from friends or just hearing people speak about it, they say rather than using the extra money they have saved from not going out to bars or clubs or whatever, whatever else like gyms, they're spending more money on Amazon or basically purchasing, you know, it's, they, they, they find that they have more money so they can purchase other things. Oh, like, let's say they've been waiting to buy, I don't know, some outdoor patio furniture for months and months and months. They'll buy that and then they get carried away and then they start buying new clothes and they start buying all these other things on Amazon. Where, like, where are you going to wear the new clothes? Exactly. That's <laughs> my point. I mean, I guess maybe, so, maybe shirts, right? Like from like waist up, you spend yeah, money. Sure. But like, don't go splurging on pants. Oh yeah, just buy yeah, buy the suit top, just the jacket. <laughs> right. Don't even bother with Go to it. JC Penney's, go to Macy's, yeah. just get the jacket. So I mean, yeah, that's those are just random examples, but essentially people are not utilizing their extra savings. Fine, I'm okay, fine. You instead of spending that hundred dollars that you would going out to the bar, okay, fine, spend that hundred dollars for that month on, you know, downloading movies or from Amazon, mm. whatever, but don't use the full extra four hundred that you're saving on just whatever it is you know right be smart with it maybe get to your goals a little bit sooner say hey now i can actually use this money and purchase a home you know one year sooner than i could have before sure i can go on a bigger trip next year once covid is is hopefully you know finished (laughs) yeah so interesting so i'm gonna ask you a question that i did not send to you ahead of time so if you can't answer that's okay we're, we're heading towards election time, yep. right? Which is throwing everyone in a loop, super contentious, just like it was in 2016, right? What have you seen in the past during election cycles in terms of personal finance or the stock market? Is there, basically, what are your thoughts on that? So, uh, yeah. I know, total curveball. No, but, it's cool. I like it. So, in short, everyone, so a lot of times people think short term in the stock market right. versus long term. Mm-hmm. So a lot of people think, like they, a lot of people believe that the election results strongly influence the stock market and financial markets altogether. But since I want to say the early 1930s, I actually just read about this, I think maybe ni- 1933, okay. the stock market has gone up over the long term, regardless of which party was in office. Yeah, same so, with real estate. Yes, so it, it's, it doesn't matter if it's a Republican or Democrat, maybe the next day after the election, the stock market will move one way or the other. Mm-hmm. But in the long term, based off of just the research, the stock market will go up. 
So I think, I don't remember the exact move it was, but I know a lot of people were thinking, like half the people said the stock market was going to go down if, when Trump was elected yeah. years back. And then other sure. people said, oh, the stock market's, they're like, half of them said it's going to go down, half of them set up, but I said it was going to go up. Well, the stock market went up of like a percent or two, I forget exactly how much. Yeah. And that was that. Whereas, like we just moved on. Yeah, the majority of people thought, oh, this stock, it's going to tank. We, <laughs> it's I'm I'm like okay maybe but <laughs> why not like yeah but but long term it it, it has no effect yeah. so which makes I, sense yeah. right especially you know throwing Trump in there some might say well the market's going to crash because of the way he portrays himself and then some people say no it goes up because he's in theory going to be more business friendly right so it could go either oh, yeah. way there there's positive you can argue positives and negatives to sure. each candidate Each candidate everyone. whatever yeah we don't want to keep it, get this too political but basically right. uh, my view is that you know ongoing consumer spending and monetary policy from the feds the federal reserve is mm -hmm. more are often they're, they're the two factors i feel like that dictate the financial markets more so than which president or which political party is in office essentially interesting so, point yeah so what should people, okay, another curveball. So you mentioned that it's more about the Federal Reserve than it is about who's in the White House. What should people be reading if they wanted to get some insight into the stock market, how the numbers work? You know, what Ooh, do you read? That's a good one. Yeah. I read a lot of uh, number heavy stuff. I know a big popular, huh. a big popular one that's more so easy would be, uh, like Yahoo Finance, I know is a big, is a popular one. A mm. lot of, it's, it's hard to say because some of these are very biased one way or the other. Yeah, it makes it a little challenging. Yeah, I mean, I, I want, sometimes I have Yahoo News in the background. I actually have some stock. I, I personally trade stock options. So I have some of that up in the background, but I usually just read some of the business pages like on your, they have apps. So let's say for Google news, I don't, I don't really read specifically stock market news, but I'll read more of like the business section so I can see more so what's going on with business and maybe different tax mm. quote unquote things that are coming out. But I know, you know, the people love wall street journal. I think you have to pay for that subscription. Right. Uh, which is a very popular one. It's a good one. Yahoo Finance, I mentioned that one's free. It's very popular. Some people like CNBC, but some people might say that's a little biased one way or the other. Uh, I'd have to get back to you on that. I could, if we do show notes or something, I can yeah. drop maybe my, my favorite top three or four go to. That'd be good. Hard, yeah, depending on how experienced you are with the, with the markets and economy. Nice, I appreciate that. So let's talk about you as we, we kind of get to the end of this, what kind of clients do you like to work with? You know, what should, what should people be expecting when working with you or really any financial planner? Like what, what should those expectations be? Okay. So with, so first and foremost, you, they need to be competent, right? I feel <laughs> sure like a lot so. of, yeah, I feel our generation has a good under has a good gut feeling of whether this person knows what they're doing. And if not, we are the Google generation, I guess let's call it. So sure. you can Google and make sure they are legitimate. They have the proper licenses. They don't have any disclosures you got to worry about. So I guess we can get to that later, but I'll focus on who the first part of the question, basically like who I am, who I work with. So yeah. I, so I've been doing this since, let's say to the end of 2014, I've been working personal finance. I ended up getting the CFP, which is the certified financial planner uh, certification back in 2017. And basically I ended up started, I ended up leaving the firm I was at to start my own firm. So I could cater to specific, a specific niche. And that is the millennial generation. So I basically left the, the old school ways that a lot of financial advisors, financial planners work so I could create a newer type of business model and work mm. with millennials. And as the last few years have gone or last two years, let's say my niche has dialed down 
a lot more tightly to millennials because I'm, a, or excuse me, entrepreneurs, because I'm an entrepreneur myself. I'm a business owner. So I primarily work with millennials, let's say late twenties to mid thirties, maybe late thirties who are entrepreneurial minded. They might have a small business that they're looking to start, or they might be in business for two or three years, let's say. And the way I work with my clients is I work with them on an ongoing basis. So I charge them a monthly fee, a financial planning fee, and we cover everything from how much to save each month, how much to invest each month. When can you buy it by a home? We look into the home and auto insurance. Are they properly covered there? I basically tell my clients I'm their personal CFO. So obviously I don't want you calling me at 12 AM unless it's a legitimate emergency, you know, that you can assume you an answer. Right. Well, yeah. I mean, I have my phone on me. There's been one, I can say one time I got a call on a Sunday morning. It was like six something in the morning from a client of mine and I answered and it was sort of an emergency. Hmm. So I basically was able to give her the proper information of how to take care of her situation. But yeah, generally if you're going to call me at 12 AM to ask me a, a question about, you know, which policy might be best for you. Can you just save it, save it for the next day. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, no, in general, I, I basically, I treat myself as I, I tell my clients, I'm, I'm their personal CFO. Mm -hmm. I give them a financial portal login so they can see in real time, all of their linked accounts, how on track they are for their goals. That's fascinating. Us, us millennials love the technology. For sure. So yeah, this is basically you, one login, you see your own, everything that you have, all of your investments, your loans, student loans, all that good stuff. And then for the clients I do work with on an ongoing basis, I also offer investment management services. So if they want to, if they want my help managing their portfolios, that's something I do for them. The major, some of my clients, I was gonna say the majority, but it, it's a, it's a mix. I can't say it's a majority, but let's, a lot of my clients like to trade in the stock market or trade cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes I'll manage 90% of their monies of like their, of their investable assets. And then the other 10%, five or 10%, let's call it, they will treat that as their Vegas. So they'll play the stock market. Mm. So I have a client who is a tech geek in the sincere, like not, not it's a term of endearment. Of he's course, of course. The biggest, he's the biggest tech geek out there. Like I go to him for anything tech related. But anyway, so he, he likes to trade tech stocks to see if he can outperform the NASDAQ or whatever that may be. And mm -hmm. then I have another- uh, But they do another, that on their own. Correct. So I don't manage that. That's, that's them. I have, I just, I say treat it as your Vegas, you know, mm -hmm. be okay losing it. I don't, <laughs> I don't focus that. So I will manage for the basically, so I'll have clients, I'll say, okay, let's have, three different pools of money. One is for your emergency fund, let's say. The other one is a down payment purchase, like home plan. And then the other one might be a retirement plan. And then they have some money left over They say, hey, I wanna play cryptocurrency, see if I can hit it big or see how I do trading stock options. So I'm not, I don't advise on that. You know, mm -hmm. if they have a couple questions here or there, like from an educational standpoint, I can speak to that, but. Uh, I won't manage on that. So how, what's it different? Cause you mentioned you charge a monthly fee. Yes. What's the difference between that versus some financial planners that just take a percentage every year of their investments? Yeah. So the traditional way that it's been done for many, many years is you go to a financial planner, financial advisor, you say, here's my hundred thousand dollars, manage the investments for me. And that's about it. Or so, well, that's not, not necessarily, that's about it. Sure. Right, let me back up. <laughs> so the financial advisor, financial planner would take that hundred thousand dollars, charge a fee. I'm just saying 1%. That's usually the average, give or take a, a fraction of a percent. And they say, okay, Rick, for that hundred thousand dollars, I'm going to charge you 1%. So I'll make a thousand dollars a year. I will manage your portfolio. I will provide updates to you and I will, provide some ad hoc financial planning. Basically, if you have questions about your insurance policies or budgeting, mm -hmm. should you buy a car, lease a car, whatever that may be. Some financial planners will be all encompassing. So they'll say, hey, you, you have enough money to invest with me. Let's say you have half a million dollars. I'm gonna be making maybe $5,000 a year, about 1%. 
I'm just saying 1% because it's an easy number. Right, right, for sure. And for that, I'm going to manage your investments and I'm going to provide you the full pop financial planning, the comprehensive, I'm going to build that plan. I'm going to offer you that financial portal, whatever that is. The reason why, not the main reason, but one of the reasons why I don't do that is because I want to be able to access people in our age demographic. And that is because people our age might be making $100,000 a year, but they might not have $100,000 to invest. So how do I work with them? I charge them a monthly, a monthly fee. Right. Whereas these other, fascinating. yeah, these other business uh, financial planners, they, they might be great financial planners. They might also be fee only. They might not take any commissions, but if they have an investment minimum of $500,000, well, that limits the people who they work with. Generally it's skewed more toward older Sure. Clients. Which, which makes sense, right? Because they, I mean, they have families to feed, they got bills to pay. So it's not really a knock on them. If they're like, no, I have to take certain minimums because the amount of effort that can go into it oh, right. can be really intense. So, you know, it's just like in real estate, it's like there are agents out there who are the discount brokerages, right? Like they're going oh, yeah, to do 1%. It's like, uh, but then you also get what you pay for. Oh, right? absolutely. Because because look, they can't I, add that level correct. of service. No, I, I'm, all, I'm all about, look, you, you pay for what you get. I'm not knocking them for having a $500,000 minimum, minimum. For me, it's, it's, sure, they might have a minimum of $5,000 per year of what, the client, of what the client pays, but they're just set up that the way they pay is through the investments. Whereas I might say, okay, my, my minimum fee from the client is $5,000, but you can pay me on a monthly basis rather than me earning it from your investments. Well, no, because I think you posed an interesting point because if someone has, you know, $100,000 in investments with a financial advisor, you know, they get paid whether the money goes up or down, but more importantly, what if I want to pull out that money to go buy that house? Exactly. They, I mean, if they might be a financial advisor, they might actually say, don't do it because then they get paid less. Not to say there's you know, ethical integrity and all that, but it's just like, that is a factor for them Correct. versus your model. It's like, no, if you need to pull out that money, you can pull out that money. Like you oh, can yeah. be level headed. Exactly. Well, yeah, that's, that's exactly one reason why too. So I do at my current business model. I mean, I'm always changing. I, not always, but I may change this in the future, but I do sure. add, I do charge a, an additional percent to manage my clients' investments. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a lot less than I would had I not been pit, been charging a monthly fee. It's just right. so my clients, they can use it or not. I have some clients who don't use me for the investment management services. I'm okay with that because they're still paying me for the financial planning. Sure. But to your exact point, the main reason why I wanted to set it up like that is because let's say my client has most of their money invested in a 401k with their company. I'm mm -hmm. not earning, I'm not managing that for them. It's not in my, it's not what, you know, I'll help them allocate it properly, but I'm not managing it directly for them. So I'm not making money off that. So let's say their main investment with me that I, I would be making money off of is in their down payment fund for their house. Mm. And okay, the time comes that that $250,000, they're going to just rip it all out of the, the investment portfolio to put into the, the house. Well, okay, that's a couple thousand dollars less in revenue. So I will, it, me from, as a, from a fiduciary standpoint, of course, I would not, I would put the client first, but sure. it is kind of a little bit of a sting say, oh, wow, now I'm going to earn right. a couple thousand dollars less. <laughs> but for me, now that, for me, I don't, I don't, it doesn't bother me because they're paying me right. regardless of what, of what right. they're investing. Which is, I think, smart. And this is a little bit going kind of the behind the scenes of being a financial planner. Right. And, they, and these are things to think about. So if someone is older, right, someone that's not a millennial and they want to meet a financial advisor, financial planner, these are the types of things they have to think about. Oh, yeah. Well, I will say, yeah, there, so you want to work with someone who, so a lot of people will call themselves a financial advisor, financial planner. If, even if mostly what they do is sell insurance products or just sell investment products. So I'm not a fan of mm -hmm. that. I don't really agree with that. So you want to look for someone who is either fee based, which means they're more primarily earned fees. Primarily the best case scenario would be fee only, which is what I do. So they don't earn. So regardless of what type of investment you, you do with them or whether or not you invest with them, you're, they're going to earn 
the same fee and that fee is going to be paid directly from you, not from some company that they, or product that they recommend to you. And to tack that on is some of these older clients who might have the money to invest, they might prefer to have that fee come out of their portfolio because they don't see it come out of their checking account or each month. It's just, it's there. It's part, it's part of the investment. They don't have to worry a bit. Like they, they don't notice the, the fee as much, I guess. Right. They don't have to worry about seeing each month or each quarter a fee or a debit coming from their, their checking or savings account. Got it. This has all been really good stuff. I, I really appreciate this. How can oh, people, how can people find you? So we're, we're in LA. So I'm trying to uh, grow my Instagram base shameless plug that's so okay that, that that's okay it's hard see you want to be a financial influencer yeah, i get it right, exactly check your ass no. with money like I get it. <laughs> <laughs> so well the easiest way would be to either check out my website which is www.fromplanningtoliving.com uh, or if they want to contact me directly it's michael at from planning to living.com I'm happy to answer any questions. My Instagram is at from planning to living. So I'm slowly growing that. I'm slowly growing that. So if you decide to follow my page, I'm slowly going to be adding tips and tricks or financial hacks, whatever you, you want great. to call that. I'm also working on a financial course for entrepreneurs. So that is in the works, but uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited. Rick, thank you so much for having me. It's always a fun time. Always. Getting it up with you. Of course. All right. 